Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for um, waking up so early, everybody, uh, to learn about Ubuntu Touch. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so here's some info about me, but that probably doesn't interest you because you are here to learn about Ubuntu Touch, right? So this is a sentence I used to hear a lot over the last two years, but not anymore, not at this event. I heard it exactly once, and that is very, very new to me. I thought Ubuntu Touch was discontinued. Doesn't happen anymore. We are really at a point now where the community, the UbiPods community, is as vibrant as I have never seen it before. So this is a picture we, we took today. Uh, thank you, Vimpy, for, for organizing this. Um, it's really amazing. It's so heartwarming. I, I sent it to, to a couple other uh, project members as well, and everybody was so excited about this. Um, it's, it's really awesome to see. So uh, originally for this talk, I had plans to start with a history lesson, because this is basically part two of a talk I did one and a half years ago at Ubicon Europe in uh, Gijon. Um, but since like every other person I talked to at this event already uses Ubuntu Touch either uh, as a daily device or as a secondary device or at least has tried it out from time to time, I think we can skip the history lesson because you, you already know uh, quite a lot. Um, so yeah, it's part two of what we did in Gijon. Uh, and um, I thought uh, we should maybe walk through what uh, we promised you guys at, at uh, Giron and, and see what of those promises uh, were kept and maybe also what were broken and maybe what we can do in the future. So the first one is the UbiPorts Foundation. That's the big one, the interesting one. So of course, if you um, have an open source project, you need an organization behind it an organization that the community can organize in, an organization that can sign contracts. So in Giron, I told you the UbiPorts Foundation will be live in two months. Two months later, it was not live. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to announce that uh, the UbiPorts Foundation has been um, granted legal capacity on August 30th by the Berlin Senate. So we are now... Um, a non-profit foundation under German civil law. We are modeled after the Document Foundation, so we can um, receive uh, donations, we can give out um, tax credit for those donations, at least in Germany and in some parts of Europe. We are still sorting out some of the details because it's very new for us as well, but it's also very exciting. This is something we have been working towards yeah, since, since the beginning, basically, and it's very exciting that it's finally here. Um, it is, it's been a very, very complex, uh, complex way to set this up, uh, and a lot of, of things that were unforeseen for us. So for example, uh, we're still working on the last few kinks because that's also the reason why you haven't heard about, uh, it being operational before because we really wanted to have everything in place. We wanted to be able to accept, uh, for example, bank transactions. Uh, so for example, Right, uh, right now, as we speak, um, Ewald, my colleague on the board of directors, is uh, traveling the world and talking to banks uh, to sort everything out and, and set the rest up. But this, this has been the big step. The rest is peanuts. So it will be there very soon. So uh, let me give you the executive tour of the UbiPorts Foundation. Uh, as I said, it's modeled after the Document Foundation, which is the developer of LibreOffice, but you probably don't know how they are organized in detail. Everybody uses LibreOffice, but uh, not everybody is a contributor, right? So if you're talking about a community, of course, the most important part is where there's many, many people, many volunteers. And for us, that is the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees consists of people who really identify with the project, who will contribute a lot, who are valuable members, and uh, who have voting rights in the foundation. These Board of Trustees elect a membership committee, which then oversees applications to join the Board of Trustees, uh, and um, and uh, yeah, controls everything, so it's kind of a, uh, a feedback loop. The Board of Trustees also elects a Board of Directors, which controls the the day-to-day -day operations of the foundation. That doesn't mean that they control the development tasks. That is 
a little separate. We have uh, other bodies for that. Um, but uh, it is elected by the Board of Trustees as well, and the election for the Board of Directors is overseen by the Membership Committee, and the election of the Membership Committee is overseen by the Board of Directors. So you have checks and balances, there's also many other uh, provisions that we don't have to go into in detail. Uh, for example, if someone were to uh, turn out to be very malicious, you have also uh, impeachment proceedings that you can uh, call on. Uh, let's hope it doesn't come to that, but we are also secure in that way. Another part is the advisory board, which um, companies and organizations that we cooperate with can join and uh, advise us, as uh, the name says. Um, we also can accept sponsors in the foundation. So there can be individuals who really love the project, who want to, to pay some money to get some recognition and really just help the project, but can't uh, contribute in a different way. Uh, so we have provisions for that as well. Speaking about so sponsors, um, I want to take a second to uh, thank some organizations that helped us get here. I mean, of course, the big one in the first place is Canonical, because without Canonical, there would no, be no Ubuntu Touch, but uh, also with Canonical, there could have been no Ubuntu Touch. So these are some companies that helped us uh, along the way uh, after Canonical uh, gave up the leadership of Ubuntu Touch. Uh, so Smooth and Private Internet Access are uh, big ones who really helped us financially. Uh, and DigitalOcean and Packet.net helped us uh, with infrastructure so we could get the, uh, every every packages built. So in in uh, in our GitHub organization, we have 490, I think, repositories, and all of those need to be built. You can't do that on your own computer. That would take a year, and we want to release more than one update a year. So uh, that has been great help. Also, there are many, many people in the community who uh, made small donations on Patreon, on LibrePay, via PayPal, in the future also bank transactions, and that has been really helpful. So thank you everyone who, who donated there for believing when, when nobody else believed. So this is a slide you've already seen if you were in Gijon. This is... Um, this was our future plan back then, right? So in Gijon, we had just really recovered. So it was one year after Canonical gave up the project. So we had just recovered. We had just forked everything. We had just set everything up. I think we were at the third release, which really just uh, integrated everything, took over all the infrastructure, everything. It was a huge undertaking until there. So we were also very motivated back then, but it was a lot smaller. We had a lot less contributors, a lot less, less users. So this was our plan back then. So we said, okay, we need to create a daily driver-ready device. We need to improve compatibility, and we need to gain world dominance one day so that's the third step uh so let me let me uh, walk you through the details of the plan we had in Rijon because i don't think everybody attended that one uh so the first one of course prepare a daily driver ready device some of our users of course say yeah what are you talking about i've been using this since 2015 2014 um it works but yeah it's not it's not where we want to get right so it really needs to work for for everyone it needs to work 100 percent perfectly so the next one we talked about in in uh, Gijon was 1604 back then keep in mind it, I, it feels like a billion years ago but back then we were still using 1504 which also then was pretty damn old um, so our next big step back then was to move to Xenio Ubuntu 16.04, which is an LTS release, uh, supported until 2022, 2020, 2022, yes. Um, which we did, we achieved that one. So uh, I'm not even sure about the date. It, time is passing so fast right now, but we, we uh, made that one happen, and now we're at our 11th stable release. We just froze that one. We just froze the, the final release candidate for that one. Uh, two days ago, um, which is running on, on Xenia. So looking forward, we will skip the 1804 LTS release and jump directly to 2004, at least we will try. We will not let another 1504 happen where we stay on unsupported software for longer than it, uh, than it um, is absolutely necessary. Well, of course, not, not unsupported at all, ideally. Uh, so we will, now that the cycle for 2004 is starting, we will try to look in compatibility and 
get on 2004 as early as possible. There are also some caveats to that, but um, we are pretty confident. So uh, we're going to make that happen. The next one was make installation super easy. So after this, so there will be another short session and lightning talk uh, about our installer. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can just uh, stay here. So we just said, okay, we have no phones and phones in the store. Um, putting commands in the in the command line is really intimidating for people, especially if they only have one phone and they paid five hundred dollars for it. Uh, they don't want to want to destroy it, so we need to have a super simple solution. So this is a graphical tool that is supposed to do everything for the user. Next one was Unity Eight, which is our desktop environment. Um, we are still on more or less the same version that Canonical shipped back in the day. We made um, lots of performance improvements to it. We uh, also changed our approach a little because Canonical, of course, was much more powerful. Canonical was huge, um, or is still huge, but of course the, the team working on Unity 8 was huge. So Canonical um, uh, said, okay, we can change all these things. We can change the entire world in, in one go, basically. And we say, okay, we need to kind of change this, then change that, and change that, and then we change the entire world, right? So we said, okay, some of these uh, things that Canonical started, we need to take out. Some of these things uh, we need to, to change a little. We need to see, okay, what else is going on in the open source world, and uh, then continue. So um, when, I, uh, when I was preparing this pre presentation, I first thing I did was just copy over the slides um, from the old one, uh, so I had a basic structure to work with, um, but I thought, okay, this screenshot of, of Unity 8 that was in there, that I showed in Gijon, looks really old. It's not really how Unity 8 looks anymore. And I also want to show you some new features. So this is what we call the Edge Channel. So I just told you, we just froze our 11th stable update, which means we are almost done with the development process of it, and we are now testing it. But in parallel to the last four or five updates, even more, um, we have had another channel, another um, place where development was going on, which is called Edge, because it's very new, very exciting stuff. So one thing we did there is look at the other things that Canonical was already doing uh, that didn't land on the phone yet because they weren't ready yet. And this is that. I mean, if you're using Ubuntu Touch, from time to time, you notice it looks a little different. It looks a little more like Unity 7. It has this nice thing that comes in from the side. It's called the uh, app drawer. Um, and yeah, that's not on the phones yet. It also won't be in OTA 11, but it will be in OTA 12. Because right now we're at a point where the work in Edge is basically done. So the really, really critical issues, the ones we could not, we could definitely not release with, are resolved, and we are now at a point where you can say, okay, we can put this in the normal release process, we will have this in the next stable update, we will have a month, two months, where we iron out all the kings, and that's how it's going to look. So if you look at the time, I uh, took the screenshot tomorrow at uh, 6.55 a.m., uh, so it is, that's how Unity 8 looks today, uh, and that's how Unity 8 will look in the future. Uh, so that's very exciting to me. Step two, we said back then, compatibility and co collaboration. Um, yeah, again, Canonical was a little more powerful. Canonical also had the entire desktop, so they could say, we change something here so we can change everything. Again, we don't have that power, so we have to do a little bit differently. So some of those things, Canonical is also working on with us. So. Not everybody knows, you probably know because you're pretty in the topic, but not everybody knows that Mir, the display server that Unity 8 uses and that Canonical created, is actually still in development. Uh, it also changed the approach a little, so Canonical also said, okay, this is probably a little too much. Uh, we want to follow the standards and, uh, and um, make sure we work with the entire uh, open source ecosystem, right? Um, so Mir is actually still going on and collaboration between the UbiPods development team and the Mir development team has been amazing in recent months. It's it's really taking off, and, and Mir 
is a great piece of software actually. It does a couple of things differently, uh, but than, than other things, but it just, it follows the standard, but implements it a little differently. So it, it has some advantages that are useful to us. And of course, it's good for us because it now implements the standard, the Wayland protocol, but it still works with our software, which is Unity 8. And that is amazing. So yeah, that is collaboration and compatibility uh, for the most part. So in Giron, I also said we will have Snap and Dab support pretty soon, or in the long run, we will want to have it. Um, you can install dApps, but it's not really user-friendly still. Uh, so we want to make that a lot better. Uh, we also want to support snaps. We can't yet, um, due to some, uh, some difficulties uh, that come from the way our devices, uh, our hardware enablement works, so how, our, how we are running normal Ubuntu on an Android device, on a device that was sold with Android originally, so we can't run snaps yet. Uh, that will still come at some point. Uh, as you are probably aware, the, the packaging war is still very much going on, so uh, we probably also have to support Flatpak and AppImage and everything else. Um, and we don't want know what the what the de facto way of packaging your Ubuntu Touch applications that you write yourself is going to be. We kind of lay back and 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 wait for that. Also, let the app developers decide. Probably, uh, also nobody really uses these uh, universal universal packages yet, like completely. So even in Ubuntu, many people still install many dev packages normally. Uh, so we don't have necessarily to go all in just yet. Maybe we will at some point, um, but we also want to see what everybody else is doing. Again, we want to change the, the ecosystem from within, not just change everything at the same time. So this is still coming, hopefully soon. If we're moving to 20 or 4, some of those uh, those um, issues with Snapcraft I just talked about uh, are going away, so that might be interesting. So another one in uh, collaboration and uh, and compatibility was UI toolkits. Uh, so Ubuntu Touch was really um, was really innovative, uh, or still is pretty innovative, but it really um, uh, broke some new ground in some parts. So for all the apps uh, to to really adapt to different sizes of user interface, uh, they made a lot of uh, a lot of pretty nifty things. And they made a library in, in it's a language called QML, and it uses a user interface called Qt or Qt. Uh, but they made their own library, which all of our apps are written in. Of course, for us that's great because they work and they look pretty. But um, uh, again, we want to change the the uh, world from within, so we also need to see what everybody else is doing. And um, while these uh, Ubuntu UI toolkit as it is called, was created. Um, the Qt project created the Qt Quick Controls, which um, has a, f a few of the same features that we also use, that, uh, that many other people use to develop apps. And uh, the nice thing about Qt Quick Controls is you can have themes for it. So people can write their app in Qt Quick Controls, and on KDE it will look like a KDE app, and on Ubuntu Touch, it will look like an Ubuntu Touch app because we did write a theme for it, and that is pretty cool. Uh, our app developers were really excited when we when we um, finally finished that. So another one, I uh, not I, we promised you um, in the long run was Anbox. Uh, Anbox is also a really really nifty idea. Uh, so you know we have few apps. Um, oh, no, not that few actually. We have quite a quite a lot, uh, but there are some that uh, people just need, and for many people, it is the only reason why they don't use Ubuntu Touch. They say, "Okay, I would use it. It looks really awesome. I I like the privacy aspects of it, and so on." But uh, they need uh, WhatsApp or something, and we can't build our own WhatsApp app. So, Anbox would fix that problem. Anbox is um, a way of running and Android applications on normal Linux. And Ubuntu Touch is normal Linux, uh, so it also works for us. We have a proof of concept implementation of it, but it still needs a lot of polishing, a lot uh, of, of um, 
developer love, basically, uh, because you really need your applications that you depend on to work absolutely flawlessly. And also, this is quite a big project, uh, so um, it also touches many of the other system components, so it also can't break anything else for us. So we said, okay, we need to put this uh, basically on hold until after we have Edge landed, which I just talked about, which will happen soon, and uh, until we have 1604, obviously. But we, we still want this, um, and momentum is picking up, so it uh, might come soon, TM, like we say. Finally, uh, world dominance. I mean, that's, that's what we all want, right? So it's not world dominance for Ubuntu Touch only, necessarily, but world dominance for uh, open source on mobile devices, because the way the mobile market looks right now is really not good. It's 80, 90% Android, and the rest iOS. And then some statistics list a couple more alternatives, which are all at 0%, and that's it. That's not good, we don't like that. Also, there's a lot under the hood going on that we don't like. Many um, proprietary components in the firmware, in the hardware, it's not good. We need to change that. So one project I showed you, um, one and a half years ago, was uh, pretty recently announced back then, is the Librem 5, which is a project by a company called Purism. Uh, and their goal was to build an entirely open source free software phone, even. Um, and uh, it would run KDE Plasma Mobile. It would run an adaption of GNOME that they are making. And it would run Ubuntu Touch. Um, the project continued, it uh, did grow, and uh, we tried to adapt our system a little to it, and KDE tried to adapt their system a little to it, and they started building their own GNOME adaption. Um, it will start shipping soon, but we are afraid that Ubuntu Touch won't be an option on it on launch, um, maybe later. Unfortunately, we don't have the final development device yet. We'll have to see how this one continues. But I don't want to keep you depressed. So I also want to show you a positive example. So this is the Pine phone. Pine 64 is a company that started originally making something like uh, like the Raspberry Pi, if you know that one, which is a really really cheap small computer that works pretty similar to a to a phone because it has the same type of processor that is in a phone. And the computer was hold on to your seats, thirty dollars. And uh, Pine made a similar product, it's also really cheap, and then uh, after a while they started making a laptop with Linux, it's also very low power, it's mainly meant for testing, and it is $100. And then, a year ago, they said, okay, we might also want to make a phone. We want to make it completely open, we want to make it as cheap as possible, so developers can test it, and uh, yeah, we... We want to be, uh, we want to work with as many community projects as possible. And, uh, their collaboration has been really amazingly good. So, uh, we have had, um, multiple iterations of the, of the development devices. Uh, and now the video you just saw, I didn't want to show you just a marketing image. I wanted to show you the real deal. So this is a uh, video that Mario Scripsgard, our main developer, took. Um, of the current prototype. I think it's a couple of weeks ago, so it's even better now. Uh, but we don't have a more recent video and I couldn't uh, reach him in time. He's also not here, unfortunately, but he does send his regards. Um, so yeah, this is also going to start coming out soon. It's also going to be very affordable. I don't know the exact price yet. Um, but it will have Ubuntu Touch as an option. We are uh, We are sure about that. And uh, that is really cool for us. It's really cool for you um, because this is, of course, a first iteration, right? This is the first generation. Uh, like like on the Pinebook, uh, the first one was pretty low powered, but now they are doing the Pinebook Pro, which is the, the second generation, which is more consumer targeted. The first one is meant for testing, the second one for consumers. So they might also do a second one that is a little more powerful. We don't know that yet but it might happen, and that is pretty interesting for us. They are also doing a tablet pretty soon, which they announced, and a smartwatch. Uh, 
So the smartwatch is not for us, of course, but it, for pairing probably, but the tablet we will also be supporting. But that's still way in the pipeline. So uh, yeah, that's still a little down the road. Okay, um, let's open this for questions. I'm sure you have many things that, uh, that you're asking yourselves. Um, so yeah, I'm here to answer them. Oh, we have a microphone, that's awesome. Good preparation. Uh, what is your motivation to spend your time in this project, like UbiPorts? Um, so actually, I joined the. Uh, anybody heard? Okay. Uh, actually, I joined the Ubuntu community really late. So my first Ubuntu version was fourteen oh four, and then then uh, sixteen oh four. I started to get really involved. So I was really late to the whole Ubuntu Touch party. Then I got a Fairphone, and I saw okay, these UbiPorts people they are porting to the Fairphone, and I thought this is really amazing, and I want this. And then shortly after it was discontinued, and I thought, okay, we can't let this happen. I mean, the, the mobile market is so closed, it's, it's, it's just no good. Canonical was very, very close to a major breakthrough. Um, it was, it does still have its issues, Ubuntu Touch. I, I'm not gonna lie to you. It's not for everyone yet, but we want to, we want it to be for everyone. So we said, if someone comes along, and um, makes a device that is completely open because our currently supported devices and the OnePlus One, I don't have it in my pocket, I have it in my backpack, but my OnePlus One, like under the hood, it is pretty hacky, right? Because we have to do lots of weird things um, to get normal Linux running on a phone like that. So it, under the hood, there's also still some closed parts. For example, we don't have open source drivers for everything. And that is not nice, but it's, it's a risk we have to take, right? So we said, if someone comes along and builds something that is completely open, and we also saw some other tendencies with um, uh, Internet of Things devices coming along which have support for normal Linux and not the Android Linux. Uh, we said, if that happens, we want the entire other stack to still be maintained because the entirety of Ubuntu Touch, except for drivers, is open source, it's free software, mostly GPL. Um, we want that to be there, so it is already ready for a consumer. Just needs a little more polishing, and, but it's already there. So we said, if we let this die now, where will we be if we have this device? Then we, we, we are there and we have the hardware, but we don't have an operating system to put on there. And that would be not good, right? So that's why we do it. What's the plan about removing like the deprecated components, for example, the click format itself is not being maintained, I would assume, and the same goes for the UI toolkit itself that the canonical team created back then, because uh, I assume there's supposed to be a plan that ensures that we keep less and less dependence on the already de deprecated components and use what's already there being maintained by different upstreams like Qt and uh, different packaging formats. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we definitely want to get rid of deprecated stuff. We want to get rid of stuff that we have to maintain ourselves. If someone else has a similar thing, that is just as good, right? Uh, we just can't go ahead and say, okay, we rip everything that's deprecated out. We rip everything out that we don't want right now. We have to implement other solutions step by step because we do have people who are actively using their devices. And we, we believe that that's crucially important for our mission. Right? Because only if you can actually use it, you can get attached to it. You can really, you are really motivated to work on it. I mean, a phone is different than a laptop. If your laptop breaks, you put in another USB stick and it just boots back up and, and you're good to go. Right? But a phone is different. You depend on it in your daily life. I mean, if, if you're on the bus or whatever, if you're on the go, then you can't have your phone break. So everything needs to work and then you're really motivated to work on it, right? We have a lot of volunteers, volunteer contributors who um, mostly contribute for that reason that they, they want their own experience <laughs> to improve. That doesn't mean that we purposefully break their experience to, to get them to work, uh, but um, uh, still we believe that it's 
important that people are motivated and are attached to it, so they have to be able to use it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so we can't deprecate everything at once. To get back to your question, um, we will do it step by step. So click, for example, which is our packaging format for the people who don't know it. Um, we have uh, basically our own app store where people wrote apps that work just for us. Uh, they can also can work for someone else, but they, they have been optimized for us. Um, and they use a packaging format called Click. It's an adaption of dev packages, which Ubuntu normally uses. And it's basically um, not architecture-wise, but philosophy-wise, the predecessor of Snaps, uh, which are a little more advanced and they have a lot more uh, magic in them uh, than Click packages. So Click packages are pretty basic. Um, we want to get away from them eventually, but right now we have an app store full of apps that people use and need to use. So we can't just say, put it away. We are using Dab now. For example, Dab has some, some other issues. I don't know if you want me to go into those, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we will stay with Click a little longer. Maybe after the jump to 20 or 4, we can look at other packaging formats and step by step support others and then see um, what app developers like, what uh, other tools are available, and then say, okay, Click is now going away. The Ubuntu UI toolkit, our entire user interface is written in it. Uh, it would be a bad idea to deprecate that because Unity 8 would just be an empty page that says, okay, sorry, something went wrong. Uh, that, no. <laughs> uh, but we can uh, also exchange parts from it. So we can say, okay, uh, this component is 100% or 99% identical uh, uh, to a component in Cube Quick Control. So we can say, okay, it just uses that now. Uh, we can get rid of some parts of it like that. Um, some parts of it that are really cool and that are essential to, uh, to the Unity 8 um, look and feel and, and, uh, and uh, user interface uh, interaction philosophy. I'm throwing around words right now, but I, get, I think you get what I'm saying. Uh, so we need to keep some components, but that's fine. I mean, if you're not allowed to maintain your own software, wh what are we doing, right? Um, so we want to be as compatible as possible, but get there step by step. Okay, thank you. Um, one comment, two questions. Um, I use uh, Ubuntu Touch every day. Mm -hmm. It's my daily driver on my phone, computer, whatever. And my girlfriend, who's not too tech savvy, also uses Ubuntu Touch every day, which means that it's accessible. People can use it. Um, I usually tell people that Using Ubuntu Touch is like having a puppy. So it may crap your living room and chew your shoes, but you love it just the same. And <laughs> anyway, two questions um, uh, regarding Unbox and future development of Unbox. Um, is there a discussion going on within UbiPorts about what if Unbox works so well that it will eventually discourage people from building native apps for Ubuntu Touch? Second, um, is there any ethical discussions going on regarding the existence of proprietary applications and bit blobs running within Anbox, which would, in a way, um, go against um, our values as free software goes? Okay, um, so first, that's a great analogy with a puppy, um, but uh, to your Anbox question. Um, we had that discussion when when the first prototype was made. Um, yes, it is kind of a concern because it takes away some of the motivation uh, to make awesome new things. For example, Costales, where's Costales? Uh, he was really an, oh yeah, sorry. I, I was looking for your orange shirt, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, he was really an early adapter of Ubuntu Touch and he thought, okay, we need a navigation app. So he made one, right? Uh, so if we had Nbox, then uh, you could maybe use like OSM and or something like like that, or even Google Maps if 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 uh, you want that. Um, and probably the motivation wouldn't be as high. I agree with you there. Um, but if you're using open source apps in Nbox and they work really well, that's good enough. So then you can focus your energy on other things that are also important because we also have a lot of things uh, that are not open source, not on Android, right? Um, so 
um, we don't think that's that big of a concern because also we have uh, operating systems that work just fine and people don't want to use those because they have other concerns about them, right? So they just use them as a band-aid and then get onto other things. But we also don't want to use, lose the entire Android ecosystem when we start the revolution and move everybody over to Ubuntu Touch, break into people's homes, flash their devices. We don't want to lose the entire ecosystem, right? Um, so it does make sense to continue to support Android apps, at least in a way. Um, I wouldn't be too worried that it works too well in the next month. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, we'll get there eventually. So your second question, um, proprietary blobs to make it work. Um, so that, uh, in general, Android is open source, right? So it is free software. We can do it mostly without proprietary blobs. Um, but the problem with Android and why we, why we are not Android developers is that it's basically owned by Google. They still have to follow their licenses, but it's basically owned by them. So they can put lots of non-free components in higher up the stack. Most famously, this is the Google Play services, which all of the apps in the, uh, in the Play Store basically depend on. Some will also work without, but most of them depend on it, and even some 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 uh, apps that are in alternative stores depend on it. So that's kind of critical. Um, there are some ways around that. So, of course, you would want your apps to work, and uh, many of them just include Google Play services for like one API request that's implemented there, but you still need the entire thing. Uh, some of them still work, but just show up a warning or something. But of course, we want uh, the entire thing to work. Um, so one way around this is other projects that um, are also doing work on, on Android, like, for example, uh, Micro-G, which tries to contain Google's uh, dominance in Android a little and tries to implement uh, some things in, in the free ways. Um, yes, so that might be an option. So we won't ship when we ship Nbox. This is all still in the future. We won't ship the proprietary things by default, probably. Maybe you will be able to install them. Of course, you are allowed to do whatever you want with your device because we are not crazy dictators. Um, <laughs> some of us are, yes, but uh, we try to keep those in check. Um, so yes, you might be able to install some proprietary blobs to make stuff like that work, um, but it won't be shipped out of the box and it won't be required for everything. Um, my question is about, uh, it comes with the, the, with the, uh, following this, this proprietary issue. What, what I saw in, uh, uh, in the Ubuntu Touch was the day to day, uh, applications that I use. You, you, for example, uh, WhatsApp. Uh, when I try to find, I don't see the proprietary application from the, the company that that be, uh, uh, gives the service but i see many like 20 applica uh, uh, apps that i can install to 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 get to that service and that for me and i don't know anything about programming in my mind i had this question is uh, i'm putting here my username my password to a, uh, some software that a, a third person made, and what is the sec the, the security on this? Uh, is w I have for to, to to access this service twenty applications available? I don't know which one I choose, and I don't I don't know if the the code was audit, and uh, what 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 is going on? Where is my data? Is uh, is going to just uh, th that's why I, I will prefer to have the uh, the uh, the application built by the uh, the, the company. Right. Um, 
but if your application is built by one of the big five, for example, um, you are not unsure if your data is misused, you are certain that your data is misused. Uh, so I, I don't know if that logic definitely works for you. Um, so I, I would also say that problem is not uh, unique to, to us. It's like every open source project, every free app store, every, everybody shares that basically, right? Uh, so we, Ubuntu Touch, won't ask you for your uh, email address and, and password because you don't have to log into anything to use Ubuntu Touch. But, uh, and, and, and talking about the applications. The applications, yes. I mean... that were made by another person because if I have WhatsApp, I know... I know if, I'm sorry. If I have WhatsApp, I know that I'm giving them all my, all my data. The thing is, there is another dev developer that wrote code I don't know how to read this. I just know how to click and install. And uh, um, for for privacy purposes, isn't that uh, an, an an issue? I'm sh I'm sure it is an issue. Uh, I don't have a great answer for you. Um, I mean, if it's open source, that means maybe if even if you can't read code, someone can read it. And if it's out there, there's a higher possibility of someone doing malicious stuff being caught than if, if it's closed to us. If it's closed to us, you don't really have a chance. Uh, I mean, you still have to, to trust people, but people also, some of them at least, will operate within the law. So if it's, if it's a normal company that is registered in a country where you know the legal system works more or less, then you probably have more of an inclination to trust them. If it's just some random person or completely anonymous, maybe not. Um, especially if it's close to us. But I don't think that's a problem that's really specific to us, and I don't think if we have to solve that at, at an organizational level. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Any last questions? Uh, hello. Uh, I would like to comment to the Miguel uh, comment <laughs> about, I think it would be really good to have, for example, Microsoft Office in Ubuntu because it's giving one service for some people. Then in the form, maybe have WhatsApp will be very good. Um, for you, uh, I would like to ask about Unbox, um, how will work the the privacy, for example, I, I will use Google Maps and it will be a container for avoid uh, give the data or all my data to Google or will be work like in Android. How will we work uh, Unbox in Ubuntu Touch? Thank you. So Unbox in of itself is a container. So it definitely um, solves the problem of any app just being able to access everything that's on your device. Uh, but of course, if you are Google, using Google Maps and you have location access enabled, you will give them your location, right? Um, yeah, that's that's your choice. But it will be a little more transparent to you. It won't have access to it all the time because only if, if the app is running. Um, but yes, you can solve that completely. I mean, we can't take over the Google Maps service, right? Um, your second uh, is that a sufficient answer? Okay, so your second remark about uh, Microsoft Office, we won't get that to run on the phone, at least not the .exe file you run on, on your Windows machine, right? We won't get that to run on the phone because that's compiled for a processor that is in a desktop computer and we don't have the same pro type of processor in the phone, so it doesn't understand the, uh, the executable program. Uh, so that's not going to happen, uh, but also we see um, Microsoft is moving some things to web-based uh, user interfaces, so things like that might work. I'm not sure about the status right now, also because I don't use it, um, but it might work. Also, it might change a little in the future. I mean, there are some exciting things also with restructuring going on at Microsoft, so it might also happen, right? Also, Microsoft is getting back into uh, into phones, um, not with Windows Mobile, but uh, with um, uh, an Android variation. So the the Android versions of of Office might be more maintained in the future. Something 
like that might work, so you could run those in Anbox, but we'll see. Right now it's not possible. Okay, if there's no more questions, I would like you to uh, to remain seated for uh, just a few more seconds uh, because I have something I want to show you. Um, just I wanted to do it after the Q&A session to, uh, to finish really with something fun. So let's go. Okay, we don't have audio set up. This is a major bummer. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, it worked before. We can cheat. Okay, let's cheat. I am up for cheating. Where are the speakers on your laptop? The speakers are there. Great, turn them on. <laughs> and now, uh, okay, I'm, I don't know if that will work, but... Uh, can I find out? <laughs> We live in a world that is rapidly taking away one of our core values, freedom of choice. Freedom does not exist without real choice, and this especially applies for the part that is quickly becoming more and more central in our lives, our mobile devices. These are not designed with our best interests in mind, but yet they are so essential in the way that we now conduct our lives. The mobile market is dominated by a few big companies who, in return for our data, how, where, and what we communicate, let us use their services and make us dependent. These companies control the complete chain, from manufacturers to employees, from telecom providers to subcontractors, from developers to end users. One way or another, it will affect you. We firmly believe in an open, transparent, and secure world where you can choose which mobile platform you want to use independent of the hardware you buy, where you can choose how and which data you want to share with whom without making concessions. In a world where there is freedom of choice at every level, Manufacturers should have the choice to pick their components without any limitations. Developers shouldn't have to worry about censorship or the powerful agendas of monopolies. And users must always be in charge of their online identity. We want to make available a new option for everyone. A beautiful, free and open source mobile operating system. We believe that the timing is right with the dominance of the mobile market combined with its lack of choice for the end user. The complete chain is ready to join forces and shift back towards freedom of choice. Now is the time to get involved. By working together, we can start a revolution that will result in a healthy regime change which puts the control back into people's hands. We need your help to achieve this. Join our growing community of volunteers and passionate people across the world and support the foundation. Help in whatever way you can and be part of this exciting revolution. The choice is yours. Ubuntu Touch. Thank you. If you want to learn more, go to ubports.com or ubuntutouch.io. Um, get involved, donate if you can, would be awesome. So, but first of all, thank you for your attention and uh, spread the word. It's amazing that you're all here. It's great. Thank you. <laughs>